And we made a discovery purely by accident. We found that the level of energy that the pig seems to find uh, in the commercial environment was very different, much higher than the academic environment. At that point, we doubted the data, we tabled it, but at the end of the day, there's a different answer in the academic environment than there is a commercial environment. The answers are not in conflict, but they're different for good reasons. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Red Podcast, where we explore the science behind swine nutrition. I'm your host, Jorge Estrada. And today in our podcast, we have Dr. Dean Boyd. For the second time, he's going to help us to understand a little bit better the soybean bean net energy in principle and practice the great schism result. So last time, we discussed a little bit uh, regarding the theory the different values of net energy. And now in this episode, we're gonna dig a little bit more into the practical ways to get into the net energy. And also we're hoping that Dr. Boyd is gonna um, share with us some of the resources that we can go and look for to explore a little bit more in this. Going to, to that specific point, Dr. Boyd, which is basically the practical uh, formulation in order to feed pigs, so it is also my understanding that although you believe that the estimate of the net energy coming from Illinois um, for soybean meal is correct, that value might be a little bit different of the recommendation for commercial practice, meaning that in commercial practice is probably a higher value. Is this true? Yes. You have just taken us, Jorge, to the second side of the coin. Uh, what we have just sorted out is the classic or substrate net energy for soybean meal. And the estimates that Hans Stein has vary less than 1% from what Hanor has, very similar to Cargill Animal Nutrition. Now, those that is classic net energy, and that's important to sort out so that the absolute minimum net energy used uh, to compare ingredients in a database is established correctly. Now, I want, we're now at a, at a uh, where we just flipped over the coin. Uh, when we were sorting this out back in the early 2000s to 2010, we took the growth assay that we conducted in relatively academic uh, circumstances and with uh, low pathogen um, and low pig density, et cetera. And we applied it to a very capable commercial environment where the uh, there were 10,000 pigs on a site, two barns were retrofitted, extremely good research facilities, and, and you have them, many others that. And we made a discovery purely by accident. And um, we, we found that the level of energy that the pig seems to find uh, in the commercial environment was very different, much higher than the academic environment. And so at that point, we doubted the data, we tabled it, and, but at the end of the day, there's a different answer in the academic environment than there is a commercial environment. And Jorge, Jorge the, the answers are not in conflict, but they're different for good reasons. No, that, that, that's excellent insight. And it's very similar what has happened with other ingredients, right? I mean, what happened with DDGs at the time and stuff like that, we know when we were learning how to use them, right? So yeah. um, why, why do you think, you know, pigs in the university setting will give a different net energy value for soybean meals compared to those pigs in a co commercial environment? Uh, pardon me for a minute. I'd like to make one additional point. Uh, the data that we found uh, was in 2010. 
I told you that we indefinitely tabled it. I failed to tell you that in that setting, a commercial setting, we didn't get the 82 to 83 percent of corn energy. We got 109 percent of corn. And that stunned us, depressed us. We tabled it. Aaron Gaines and I then worked with the CP group nutritionists who are quite capable, who decided maybe we weren't good researchers and they could help us out. So they did so. They conducted a study with soybean in commercial environment, early growth, and mid-finish. And they came to us so depressed. I've never seen them, and almost ashamed, because they said in the early phase uh, in of growth, we got 110% of corn. In mid-finish, for a long period, we got 98% of corn. So we resurrected our data, and it appears in Feedstuffs Article 2. And then since then, Jorge, you are aware um, that not only has KSU and JBS had done these studies, but so have various integrators, and you have been kind enough to make your data uh, public. So as to why, that, that's what you're asking about. Um, we learned, um, I, I guess some things you do right, and later you discover how right it was. Um, when we conduct these studies, and certainly when Cargill, Cargill conducts the studies, and when Ralston Purina, when they were in pig business, used to, we conduct those in an academic university-like environment. And um, you can't have temperature problems. You can't have pathogen challenges, all those things. But when we move to commercial operation, the concentration of pathogens and uh, immune challenges can be significant, even though the pigs are healthy. So we said, we'll label this extra nutrient effect as something other than a nutrient effect as productive energy. And productive energy is not something you generally apply. It's for this limited case where we said, it looks like we have the classic ingredient NE for soybean. And then once it's in the whole diet, there's something about it that causes the diet energy to be conserved and pushed toward growth. There's some physiological benefit that we're getting from the soybean that we can't describe in terms of what we know about nutrients. So it's, it's an environmental difference uh, as, as we expect it at this time. Kemen calls all swine experts. You already know the key to a profitable swine operation is healthy, productive pigs. Our team of swine experts are driven by curiosity to create science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash swine. No, this is a, such a fascinating topic, and not just for soybean meal, but as you're saying, this probably has a lot of impact from the commercial environment compared to the university environment for very many ingredients, right? Yes. So yeah. before, uh, before we let you go, um, could you let us know where can people maybe go to further study the research and the principles that we have discussed today? We can decide how to best get this to those who are interested. But I would say the best single source for the classic net energy sorted out from the productive energy in the commercial environment is the paper that Aaron Gaines and I published in 2024 in the Midwest Swine Nutrition Conference of 2024. It's in their proceedings and I think um, we can decide how to make that easily available to them. Uh, the next thing is there's a series of feedstuffs papers, uh, Jorge, that you're aware of. Um, these are very competently done, 
Not a single one of those studies that I was involved with were paid for by the soybean group. Um, these are located on the website Soy Effect. One word, soyeffect.ussoy.org. If they then look for additional resources, they'll see Feedstuffs articles. And uh, Feedstuffs article one and two will help them greatly. Uh, I'm happy to provide my uh, email address if you would like. Of course, Dr. Boy, please go ahead. Uh, all small case, D is in Dean, Boyd as in Boyd, <laughs> D-B-O-Y-D at C is in cat, I-N-E-T dot N-E-T, dboyd at cinet dot net. I'm happy to receive all comments, questions, uh, abuse if they would like to. So, Dr. Boyd, thanks again for, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everyone else, thanks for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Med Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us some comments. Join us in our next episode.